So welcome everybody. My name is Rachel from Bats Without Borders and um, I'm delighted to welcome you to our 12th webinar. And today we have, we're going to be hearing about bats and eco-services in South Africa and we're going to be giving a talk by Professor Peter Taylor um, and his work is done in collaboration with Drs. Valerie Linden and Dr. Lena Weyer. And uh, Peter's going to introduce his team and kick off the talk. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, Rachel, very much. Um, I'm going to try and do the screen sharing now and then start. Can you, can you see me fine? Yes, yes, we can see you and we are just about to go into presentation mode. Um, hold on. Um, all right. Is it, is it okay? You're in presentation mode. Yes, that's it. You're in presentation mode now. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Helen. Thanks to Bat Without Borders and thanks to all of you for tuning in for this talk today. It's, um, you know, it's really a pleasure to share this, this work. Um, as Rachel said, my co-authors on this talk are Drs. Valerie Linden and Zena Weyer, who were um, both PhD students of mine. Um, under the chair, uh, I lead a chair on biodiversity value and change at the University of Venda. So this is part of their PhD work. I've been involved for about 10 years in this research that I'm going to be telling you about in Macadamia Orchards. Um, and Sina and, and Valerie both did their PhDs on this. So I hope my talk will only be about 35 minutes or so, and then we can have more time for questions and answers. And Valerie and Zina can and be um, able to help with the, the, the questions and answers as well. So this is very much um, their work, which I'm presenting, uh, particularly the more recent work. So, yeah, um, my interest in bats actually stems back quite a long, long time um, to the early 90s when Kate Richardson and I started a bat interest group um, in Durban in 1994. And way back even then, we, we realized how important it is to demonstrate the value of bats to the to the public and to farmers, uh, how important it is for their conservation, especially given all the negative perceptions about bats. And back then we just lamented the fact that there was no data available regionally for ecosystem services of bats, for the, you know, the particularly in predation services that they provide in terms of crop pests. And if those of you that are in the audience that are old enough will remember the Bat Conservation International slideshow that presented this amazing information about the 100 Asian elephants per night in terms of tons of insects that were consumed by bats in, in Texas. And so this was about the only sort of information that we had. And so I'm really excited that in the last decade, we've seen a lot of real acceleration in, in studies um, that are doing these valuations of, of um, the services, ecosystem services of bats. So I'm hoping I'll hear from some of you in the audience about um, some work that you've been doing as well. But I'm going to just talk um, more about the local situation, but I'm going to start with a brief global overview of ecosystem services literature on um, ecosystem services and bats. And then I'm going to just zoom into the macadamia industry and the work that I've been involved with, um, as I said, for about the last 10 years. Um, and what we've done, so I'm going to present it in these different stages. I'm going to start by telling you about the work we've done on economic valuation of bats using these avoided cost models, what I call sort of bottom-up approach. Then I'm going to emphasize the value of doing molecular dietary studies and doing this kind of research. And then I'm going to talk about some of the very recent work. This is more Valerie's PhD, doing exclusion experiments to sort of measure both bat and bird um, ecosystem services. This is more of a top-down approach. And I'm not aware of many agricultural systems or studies where, where there have been both kinds of approaches. These are two kind of approaches that are used to value, to value the services of bats, predation services. And we've sort of been able to do, to do it two different ways. So I'll present that. And then I think it's really important to understand at the landscape level how bats use habitat and how their ecosystem services and their populations vary at a landscape level in terms of especially managing um, um, agricultural landscapes 
to maximize um, bat populations and their, their serve ecosystem services. And then finally, I want to just touch on the, the, the negative impacts of agricultural intensification um, for, for which we have some evidence in the macadamias. And then some take home messages and future work. So I think you're all aware that um, the services that bat ecosystem services provided by bats um, also entail very valuable work done by that as pollinators and seed dispersers. So this particular talk, I just want to focus on one service um, in terms of crop pest suppression by bats. And this photo that I'm showing you um, is a African slit-faced bat nutrus to bike carrying a stink bug, which is the main pest of macadamias. So this was kindly provided by Merlin Tuttle. Um, he took these, these photos actually when he visited us for a few weeks um, in the area where I work and he set up a studio to take these photos. And I'm just saying that to underline the importance, which I'll come back to, of having these kind of audio, uh, these visuals, sorry, in order to really be able to, to convince farmers and demonstrate to farmers the value um, of bats in agriculture. Something Merlin Tuttle once said to me was that um, the, the actual magnitude and importance of bats to agriculture or in terms of society are much greater than even he could have imagined. So it just, it's, it's that's the, what we found with our research is that the actual magnitude and the, the amount, the, the, the value that just the service that bats provide is enormous. But often common communities and farmer communities are not on board at all. So we had to first win across the farmers um, onto our side. To start with, they didn't believe bats would eat, pests, would eat in their stink bugs and so on. So it's really important to be able to get them on board. Um, I'm not gonna go into any detail, just to say that, uh, as I said, there's been a real acceleration of, in the last decade, there's been fantastic studies done all over the world and on the value of bats to, 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 in terms of pest suppression. So whether it's rice crops in Thailand or rice in Mediterranean, rice paddies, um, um, vineyards in Chile, cotton in Australia, um, cacao and coffee in, in southeastern Asia and Latin America, beacon orchards, and of course, most of you are aware of this important pioneering work by Justin Boyles, Gary McCracken, Thomas Quince, and so on. So we have a lot more information now, which is great. We now have a consensus that actually generalist predators like birds and bats can suppress insects, leading to these ecological cascades, which um, can, can result in real monetary benefits from reduced crop damage. So the exclusion studies such as these reviewed by Bia Maas here, as well as these avoided cost models. So these are the kind of two approaches that I'm maybe simplifying, but so often where you have it, where you know the, the pest species, the, the predators such as the wrinkled bat and the, the main prey species like a white bat plant hopper, which is a pest of rice, you can do quite simple sums. And, you know, I just, I hope that my talk will, um, motivate it or convince some of you that really this kind of work is not expensive and with cooperation of farmers and some sort of knowledge of the eco economy pests and economy of the business you can actually get quite quite useful figures for the value that bats provide so you can see here this example it's just huge monetary value attached to the avoided costs of bats so i did a little review mm, back in 19, in 2018, sorry, um, just to try to review globally the work that was then available um, on the value of bats in different crop systems. And as you can see, there's on the left, there's, uh, these are either, were either studies using avoided cost models, the diet of bats and so forth, or exclusion studies. And the point is just that there's huge variation in these values. So in cotton using avoided costs, you could, values of 200 to 500 dollars a hectare a year um, and then quite variable values using exclusion studies so um, the study of cacao in indonesia showed the value of bats to be about 700 us dollars a hectare a year but another study done on cacao in a different year different time showed no net benefit of bats so it's quite variable and so the, the, this is the value we obtained uh, using avoided cost models in our macadamia study and I'll just explain a few points in a moment how we arrived at this, this value of about 100 US dollars per hectare per year. And in fact, this 
is quite an underestimate. This is just looking at bats and um, the impacts on one pest species, the sink bug. When we did the exclusion studies, which I'll also preserve, present just now, the value came for bats came up to more is much higher than that. So this is another way of presenting the same results, um, not just dollars, but what percentage of production is saved. So you can see in some cases it can be quite high, 30%. And the results I'm going to show you from exclusion studies done in macadamia orchards show values around 30, 35 for bats. And when you add birds, it goes up to about 60%. So it just, it just emphasizes, I think, how, how there's a scale and, and magnitude of the benefits that bats have that bats have that I think we always underestimate. Briefly, um, macadamia well, produced in South Africa. South Africa is the, the world's uh, largest producer of macadamias. The value of macadamias has gone through the roof. Some of you might be aware. And so the landscape is changing quite rapidly um, in the area where I work in northern Limpopo. Um, a lot of, of land has been cleared and planted for macadamias. And there's over 30,000 hectares in the country planted. And in 2019, just under 6,000 hectare, new hectares were planted. So um, it's, it's quite a changing dynamic situation. Briefly, this just shows you the four main areas in the three provinces of South Africa, the green areas where macadamias are grown and the sort of rough breakdown of the areas. And we're talking about the area in the north, the northernmost area of Levubu in South Africa. Um, just to illustrate very simply, I showed a couple of Google Earth photos here taken 10 years apart. This is the road I drive along every day through this um, subtropical fruit growing area. And this just shows some of the new areas that have been planted just in the last few years. And it's sort of ongoing process. So even, even in sort of more marginal areas, um, natural, natural um, savanna and bush fells is also being converted. So really the first step, if anybody's interested in doing this kind of research, you just have to get the farmers, the consultants, the associations, agricultural associations on board to, to win their trust and to be able to access this really important economic and pest data. So we've been very fortunate um, working with uh, macadamia growers in the Levubu area. Um, we've, we, we've had their full support from the very beginning, allowing us to build the exposure cages or bat houses. We had a secret weapon in the form of Merlin Tuttle, who many of you know, who here yeah, speaking to a crowd of farmers and individual farmers, just helping us to, just to um, really convince them of the value of bats and involving, getting involved in this research. A colleague of mine, Kua Stain, has been pivotal in this research in um, helping me get access to this community, also an academic as well as a macadamia farmer. So um, this is where the area is. It's in the north of South Africa south of the Limpopo River and west of the northern part of the Kruger National Park. So these orange colored, this is the South Prinsberg Mountains. It's a huge biodiversity hotspot, um, a center of, recognized center of plant endemism, about 50 animal endemics and highly biodiverse in bats. Up in the corner here, um, long-term study recorded 45 species of bats, this nice rodent research. And down here in the southeastern slopes is where we did the macadamia research. We've also got sort of control data from, from bats in the western South Pansburg and natural environments. So that's sort of the context. And this area is hyper diverse, it's super diverse. And bats, you can, you're very likely to get rare beasts like these species here when you put up nets and hard traps. So it's highly diverse areas. It's a really nice area to do this kind of research because we have such a high diversity of bats and good populations. So, Modeling avoided costs 101. What do we need to know? So these are things that we, we knew already. The, the price, the yield, the macadamia prices, economic data, the actual um, nut damage coefficient or nut injury coefficient of the pest, in this case the pest stink bug, which is by far the big, biggest pest. And how many eggs they produce and how do they survive? Also, how many pests do bats consume? And we, we came up with some estimates about bat population size, density, which is quite difficult sometimes to get. Just to lead you through how these data can be so useful to build these models, these are data used routinely by farmers, macadamia farmers, to, to decide when to spray a block of an orchard of macadamias based on damage by stink bugs. So 
They know how many trees there are per hectare. They know that the value of a nut, 20 cents at a certain, under certain conditions. So they know what the, the yield would be of a block. And then they, they know, they count how many stink bugs they find per 10 trees. And knowing what the damage injury coefficient is at different times of the year, how many nuts are damaged per week, you can estimate the, in a particular week, for example, this would be 312 rand, and it would cost 950 rand to, to spray that, that block. So you can then see whether it's economical to spray or not. So these data slot very nicely into our model. We also have information from the literature about nightly insect consumptions, and we have data from local studies I've done with students, both macroscopic analyses with microscopes of bat fecal pellets of six species, and, and also information from next generation sequencing DNA studies of five species. So you build all this into a model and here we go. Um, this was, um, this was, um, this is the kind of output that you can, you can get. So showing in green and red, the high and low ranges of um, bat consumption, nightly consumption, and then just remodeling it over a range of bat densities and you get a, idea of the avoided costs per hectare per year. So it could be hundreds or a couple of hundred, three, four hundred, depending on what estimates you use. So for, for, for the bat population density and for the consumption rates of insects by bats and so forth. So I don't really have time now, but if I can go into it, if anybody wants to know later, we have sort of estimates from the Durban area using radar, a radar installation system, avian aircraft avoidance radar um, images and we also had data from acoustic data that we got estimates of bat densities in different bracadamia growing areas. So just conservatively taking low consumption, we can say that bats um, have a value or save about two and a half million US dollars a year. So we realized these estimates were actually quite low. Bats don't just prey on stink bugs, they consume a range of pests. And so this was part of Sina's PhD. Sorry, so she, she developed a, a primer, um, DNA primer using the CO1 bar tag gene, sorry, barcode gene, and um, developed this system, the uh, primer to identify presence, absence of four major pest species, two different um, moth nut borer species, Academia nut borer and leachy moth, and two different species of stink bug, the green vegetable stink bug and the twin spotted. So um, using these primer sets and also to verify them, each and every um, sample was sequenced as well with a CO1 gene to verify this. So her results showed us that bats consume a lot of pests. So about 56, 55% of all the fe fecal pellet samples contained uh, sequences of barcode sequences of these four pests. And usually it was more than one pest species consumed per sample, um, per fecal pellet sample, per meal, if you like. So we also find interestingly that all species and families of bats foraged on both moths and, and bugs, hemipteran and lepidopteran pests. So the, the sort of wisdom was that um, the farmers didn't believe bats would catch stink bugs because stink bugs fly very slowly and they don't fly much and they fly low, to the, usually low to the ground. So we also thought, well, it's going to be the plateau edge feeding bats. It's, you know, it's going to be bats that can fly slowly and maneuver. But we found bats that are high flying um, aerial feeders, open air feeders, um, were also um, foraging on on stink bugs as well as as well as moths. So it's um, it's encouraging um, to tell farmers, and we also found it it that they consume pests throughout the growing season. Now, um, I'm gonna show you this video at the end because I'm tech I don't want to get waylaid by technical issues, but um, so we had a lot of evidence and we present this every year to the farmers in the, in the um, annual research meetings. And they were very skeptical for the first couple of years. And then we've had all this DNA data, but that didn't convince them. What really convinced them was um, my colleague who has stayed having, kept, he had captive bats of, of yellow house bats and um, Lyphotus bats. And he fed, he, he's a, he had access to stink bugs. And of course he fed these bats, these live bats stink bugs. And he's got a brilliant video, which I'll try and show you at the end. And of course, um, that's what convinced the farmers. From, from the moment I presented this video, 
um, they were completely on our side and funding our research. So it's, it's all well, well having the good science, but um, sometimes just seen as believing and those wonderful pictures that we had from Merlin. So, so, so the last part of my talk, I've shown you briefly how, how we've, we can develop avoided cost models and get some, with a lot of assumptions, of course, based on the diet of, of bats um, and the injury curve, the, the damage caused by the pests that they feed on. But um, now we try to verify that, ground truth that using actual exclusion experiments. This research was done with the University of Göttingen, Ingo, uh, Ingo Grass and Thea Chonka and Valerie Encina. Um, and we, we designed these exclusion experiments over three growing seasons to actually measure the impact and not just of bats, but we had, um, we had four different treatments. So we had 48 cages like that on the right there. And in both natural settings, which were adjacent to natural bush, and in unnatural settings, which were um, where cages were placed adjacent to other um, monoculture stands and orchards or other land use. And the important thing is that it's only, only in the natural edges that the monkeys are a problem. So we had to factor in the monkeys as well as birds and bats. So we had four treatments, day treatment, uh, day, night, full and control. So either the, tree, the, the cages were closed during the day to exclude birds and monkeys or closed during the night to exclude bats or they were closed completely um, 24 hours or they were open. So we try to measure the impact of bats in two ways. Two, well, two components of, of this damage. So one is the, the nut quality itself. So to order, analyze the loss, firstly, we, Valerie measured the uncounts, it's called unsound kernel, the defective nuts or the percentage of unsound or defective nuts per sample. And that, that is based on um, damage that can be determined on the kernels um, caused by the stink bugs themselves. So it's cosmetic damage, but it results in the nuts being rejected by the factory. And so, um, we could measure that in each treatment uh, cage and in the control to, to get a direct um, in, uh, idea of, of how much damage was, was changed during our, the treatments. The other component is the yield, um, and that was, that was extrapolated based on the final count of nut sets. So the, the, the nut sets on the, the, the tree flowers and then the nut set, and um, just before they fall, we, um, Valerie did counts of nuts. And that was extrapolated based on actual yield data for the area to kilograms per hectare. We couldn't just collect all the nuts under the tree because it was impossible to, to um, control for effects of theft from humans and monkeys and so forth. And then we derived the income per hectare based on, um, from the price per kg, based on the unsound kernel, and that was multiplied by the yield. So this was published by Valerie a year ago. Um, in Journal of Applied Ecology. So what did her results show? One interesting aspect was the importance of these natural edges. So there was more insect damage at unnatural compared to natural edge, um, six versus four and a half percent. Um, so there seemed to be an effect there of the natural edge in reducing damage just in control, in the control um, treatments. All of the exposure treatments resulted in reduced nut quality and there was higher treatment effects at natural edges. So all this pointed towards importance of the natural um, patches of, of vegetation that are um, retained in this, this landscape. Then in terms of the yield, it was higher at unnatural edge. And the reduced, we found a very high reduced yield for all treatments. So basically it's an effect of 60% when birds and bats are combined. And then, we found that when you exclude monkeys, not surprisingly, on the natural edges, you get a yield gain of 26%. But that benefit that you get is overweighed by the, the loss you have um, through the biocontrol loss when you exclude the birds and bats. So essentially, the loss of biocontrol is, is more important than the prevention of crop raiding. A lot of farmers argue that they should remove natural cover because they get rid of the monkeys. But what we're able to show them really convincingly is that they, they will lose more on losing the biocontrol than they might gain in, in losing the crop rating. So I know this is a 
busy slide and it, I'll just walk you through it quite quickly. This is sort of a condensation of all the results. Just showing the income effects with varying yield and quality on the left axis. So anything less than naught means that there was a loss, there was a reduction of income when the, in a different enclosure, air exposure treatment. So here's full exposure day and night. And then the gray bars represent unnatural and the green bars represent natural um, borders. So if we look only at the unnatural edges, because there the monkeys aren't relevant. So we don't have to consider the effect of the monkeys. Monkeys are only present on natural borders. So if we exclude birds and bats, essentially, it's causing a loss of $5,000 to the farmer, a massive amount, 60% of his income or her income. Um, when we exclude birds, it's, three, it's about $4,000 4, a hectare. And only bats, we exclude bats, we get a, a loss of 2,000, um, a, a decrease of income. So birds seem to have even slightly effect, uh, an even slightly bigger effect than, than bats. Uh, to, together it's a massive effect. And then, as I said, the, um, the one time we get a gain is, is with the, with the um, reduction of, with the exclusion of monkeys on the natural plots. So really it's, very simply like this, you exclude birds and bats, that your yield loss is 5,000. Birds alone, 4,000. Bats alone, two and a half. Monkeys, you get a yield gain of 1,500, but this is less than the benefits of, of the birds and the bats. So the, the last aspect I wanna just briefly touch on is, is the habitat use and the variation of bats, populations and their ecosystem services in the, at a landscape level. This was part of Sina's PhD, she did a really interesting study with a bat logger detector mounted on the antenna of a vehicle doing drive transects in four farms, five farms. Each transect was um, repeated on a monthly basis. So she had about 60 nights of transects um, driving around this farm landscape. And the width of this path just basically shows the detection range of the bat logger and um, the points show where the bats were recorded. And the different, they just indicates the different land cover types from natural bush and green to macadamia orchards, pecan orchards, other kinds of orchards and settlements. And she, she subdivided the data, the acoustic data into sort of um, bats that were, were, were high flying, open air um, feeding bats and um, with low frequency sounds and those that were clutter edge. She did record them all to species, but we classified them according to functional groups, uh, much like this, this chart here shown here in, in Ira Monagem's book. So we had clutter edge feeders and we had open air feeders and she analyzed them separately. We, in the community, she did not record any vegetation clutter bats, such as horseshoe bats. And that, that will be my last slide to show how we've, we believe we've lost that entire foraging Guild from the community. She, she didn't record any of them and her, her colleague Valerie recorded just a few. So just looking at those two, and I'm just gonna very, just give the general activity um, to show the most important factors in the landscape that affected the activity of bats and their services therefore. So if we just combine the different functional groups now, we see that bush cover was a highly significant effect. So the more natural cover in the environment, the more bats. So this ties in with our exclusion results that seem to show a, a higher a, a, a reduction in damage at natural edges to the macadamias and, and a higher treatment effect. Um, and this just shows fallow cover, uh, marginal uh, significance. And then if we just look at feeding activity, so she also subdivided the data to look only at feeding buzzes. These are feeding bats. And in this case, um, the, flutter, the clutter edge uh, guild of bats also uh, responded to, uh, significantly to bush cover, to the percentage, to proportion of um, natural bush. Once again, showing the importance of natural cover to bats. So she also had light traps two placed per transect, and these indicated a very a strong, significant relationship with between bat ac feeding activity and hemiptera abundance. So it did seem like both natural cover and the local pattern or abundance of, of, um, of, of hemiptera, including of course the, the main pest species, the stink bugs, were highly correlated. So 
I'm going to end on this slide. Just to the last aspect I wanted to mention was the negative impacts of, of agricultural intensification in these orchards. So when you first look at, at it, these are just acoustic data. So some of them were obtained from published studies in this natural area I spoke about in the mountains west of the, the, the orchards. And then these data on the right are shown from Valerie Linden's data, 43,000 calls from her PhD study. So if we look at species richness first, the top, um, the top two, we see on, on the left, uh, the natural area on the right, the orchards. It appears as if the, as they have similar numbers of species. In fact, the orchards had more, 25 species. And it seems to be that they have all three major functional group present. Clutter bats in blue, clutter edge bats in orange, and gray showing the open edge, the open air feeding bats, sorry. Um, but when you start to look at the activity by functional groups, um, what I said earlier, you see the blue strip there on the bottom left, that shows that about 3% of all calls um, in natural areas in the South Pansburg Mountains comprised of rhinolophid bats mostly, um, clutter feeding, slow feeding, slow flying, and usually cave dwelling species. On the bottom right, we see that it's um, very negligible numbers of these bats, 3.3%. So you've got to have tens of thousands of bat calls to be able to just have a handful of these. So we strongly believe these horseshoe bats, these clutter edge feeding bats, which are often more sensitive. This is what we found in, I think, studies in Europe and so forth. These bats are quite sensitive and quite quickly disappear from agriculturally intensive landscapes. So it might be a possibility to use bat houses that simulate caves like these shown on the right here, concrete blocks or used in America um, and these cement sawdust ones used in Costa Rica. So what, am I, what is the take home message? Really, in our case, where we've done both avoided cost models and um, direct occlusion experiments, we find the avoided cost models um, highly seem to underestimate the value of bat pest predation. The exclusion experiments show really high proportion of yield that 35% for bats, 60% um, for birds and bats. So, yeah, the really important point we found was that natural habitats are vital and connectivity between them. They're really important for ecosystem services and they are, they are, being, they are disappearing very fast due to intensification. Um, and we see that these natural areas, that the services they provide outweigh any of the services they may provide through having hosting crop raiding monkeys. Pesticides are used um, by all farmers. Uh, it's, it's not economically viable for them not to use pesticides against the stink bugs, or they, they, they would, they, 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 it wouldn't be uh, economical for them whatsoever. The, the loss would, would, would make it farming not viable. But uh, as I sort of indicated earlier, the acceptable way to to, to do the spraying would be to minimize the spraying and only spray when you, you can show from your scouting um, results that the number of sink bugs and the damage is greater than the cost of spraying. But a lot of farmers apply, they're lazy, they apply calendar spraying, they just spray at regular intervals. And um, we know, um, having found dead bats in bat houses and orchards, that the, the pesticides can reduce not only kill insects, um, stink bugs, but bats as well. So we hope we can persuade farmers to use a sort of a phased approach to accept some damage and realize that the service that bats are providing you, especially if you provide natural habitat for them, is reducing considerably, massively, the amount of pesticide you would need to apply so that over time, um, it would be more viable not to use pesticides. And just to reiterate that main point about from inception to implementation, if you're going to do these kind of studies, you just have to involve the farmers and in this study, the farmers are the first now to, they took the results, Valerie's results, and they issued press releases and all the agricultural journals uh, which were, were um, presenting very positive results about bats um, eating millions of stink bugs and um, being economically viable. Um, so really that's, that's it. What we're going to do in the next phase, we're going to look at these pest, um, uh, pest predation services offered by bats and birds over both land use intensity gradients, um, agricultural intensity gradients, and climatic gradients under a project called the South African Living Landscapes Network, 
funded by spaces of the spaces program the german government and so we've built new sets of exclusion exposure cages across um, the mountains from higher to lower areas we're going to look more at the role of rare species and pest control and and this phenomenon that we've lost these these fine loafids and we want to look more at natural and artificial roosts where bats are spending their time and also to try to measure more the environmental effects of pesticides on bats so thank you very much i hope you're still all with me i i can't see that <laughs> i'm happy to take questions um and for valerie and sina if they are here to help me Excellent. Thank you very, very much, Peter. That was really a brilliant talk and um, lots of great information for us. So just to let you all know, we'll be sharing the links uh, for some of this re great research being done by Peter, Sina and Valerie from the University of Venda. And I'm just going to hand over to Helen Taylor Boyd, who's doing her PhD on bats and ecosystem services inspired by Peter's work um, in Zambia. And she's also one of our, our long term volunteers. So over to you, Helen. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, thanks, Peter. That was really, really helpful. Really interesting. Mm -hmm. research. And um, I have to say that uh, talking about um, the farmers themselves and the, the media spread of, of the research that you've done um, has definitely reached Zambia. Um, I have a lot of people <laughs> already asking us for that right. because of your research. So um, that's really great. It's really good. Um, so yes, so I'll just be taking questions. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to put them into the chat box there and I'll go through them one by one. If you'd like to answer them yourself, feel free to put up your hand um, and um, to, if you want to ask the question yourself, sorry. Um, so the first question we have was from Rachel. Um, she asked, what advice do you actually have for engaging farmers? Sorry, Peter, just to let you know, you're on mute at the moment. Sorry, sorry. I was going to say thank you for that question, Rachel. I was going to ask Valerie to respond to that because she's been very proactive in, in the networking side of getting the farmers engaged. Valerie, are you here? Do you want to answer that? Yes, yes Peter, I'm here. Thank you. Thanks, um, Valerie. Yeah, I mean, one, one important part Peter had already mentioned in the presentation, so what gave us a a uh, major foot up was basically having Merlin Tuttle here showing great pictures to farmers of bats uh, predating on stink bugs. And then uh, a lot of farmers were already very excited about it. Um, and then we basically, yeah, we went door to door and um, sort of talked to farmers and um, we were very engaged with the whole farming community, going to study groups and always, um, sharing our results that we, or preliminary results that we got along the way, uh, just to keep all farmers informed about our activities. And so word basically spread on its own. And um, I also had a feeling often that farmers almost took uh, a sense of pride in hosting our research on their farms. And we were then after a while approached by other farmers that asked us, oh, can you not come to our farms and do your research here? And I've also got bats and um, yeah, I don't know. I think maybe we were also very lucky with the farming community that we have here, that they are uh, very interested uh, working together on new farming practices, uh, very engaged. Um, so it wasn't too difficult for us. Sorry, I just have to. Um, just have one to. quick thing, Peter. I um, wondered if at this point you would like to do your video um, since it's related to that question. Um, and Valerie mentioned showing pictures to farmers. Thank you. Yeah, let me try and, and do that for you. Um, um, I just need to share the screen, right? Yeah. This, right. Um, and then I just have to play this movie. Can you all see? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see that? All right. Yeah. But not your goes. video yet. Like of I find Krikko. This is my colleague who is staying. Lekker sappig. Feeding a yellow house bat. Tweede Krik. First of all with a cricket. Moest kijk wie hier of hij. Okay. Sorry, Peter. We're not able to see the video. We can hear the sound. Ah, I didn't share. Did I forget to share the the screen? 
We can actually see your um, your kind of window, uh, so with where the video is. So I wonder if you minimise that, if we can see behind it. I'm not sure. Um, can you see anything now? Should I try and unshare it and share it again? I think that might be a good idea because it might be a different okay. thing to share. I do remember Helen told me I was supposed to. Oh, I said share computer sound, and I said um, I just tried to take you to the to the place where the video is and then play the video, but maybe that wasn't the sensible way to do it. And now? No. Can you not see okay. it? Okay. I'm afraid not. Click on. What I would suggest no, is start the video if, first and then yeah. share only the, the, the media player or whatever is. Yeah. Oh, okay. Rather okay. than the file. Click on it. Like um, on click on it. Click on it. Lekker sappig. I'll try. Tweede click. Um, if you press pause right? on the video, maybe. It's been busy, can you? I'm going to try and share it again while it's well, it's um, a... while it's on. But now it says, um, okay. No. Is it, can you get this? And, um, Perfect. Sorry, that's a yellow and, house and, bed, and, 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 the, uh, and it's about to eat a stink bug. Macadamia bedrijf. Twee kost een PC bij Tikulia Natalie Cola. Kom eens kijken of wij zijn eerst op trek voor een PC. Aha. Poeh, stank. Just a few more seconds. Hier is een ander soort stank PC. In hierdie stink is um, nou nie is van die selle familie, maar hy is nie, doe nie skade aan, aan macadamia's nie, maar hy het nog een soort stink Oké. Okay. Is that, are you still there? Yes, yes. That was really uh, a good video. <laughs> um, I'm glad you got that. If you want to continue um, to uh, with your answer to the question that Valerie was answering as well, yeah, I oh, know it was just I, I couldn't I couldn't help the pun. Valerie said it so many times. Um, I just couldn't stop myself. Sorry, Valerie. She told us how engaged she was in, in this research, and she's actually engaged to the son of the biggest macadamia processor. So I was going to say that doesn't do any harm. That, that Valerie had a personal connection. Sorry, Valerie. <laughs> All good, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I would also agree with our work. Is it, a personal connection definitely helps. Um, the next question we have again is from Rachel. Are the farmers working together to reforest or restore natural habitats or some sort of connectivity in the areas? Um, I think we often preach to the converted and I, I don't think there's any conscious effort to do that. I don't know whether, Valerie, you want to apply, to reply. I also see that Elsha is here, who's one of the farm advisors, and she might want to respond. Elsha Joubert, she's uh, also been working with us, or is she not here anymore? Hi, Peter, I'm here. Thank you for a okay. brilliant talk. Thanks. Maybe you can say something as your perspective. You, you know, you have a... You 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 are the run you ran the subtrop organization under which um, this work has been done. So we have to thank you for your support. Thank you. I really enjoy the research that Valerie Sina and yourself are doing, and thank you very much for very very good work. Uh, the farmers are uh, perceiving well to the research, and it's it's really hard to convince them to to plant natural, but it is becoming easier to convince them not to remove natural um, corridors. We call it ecological corridors and, and connectivities between the orchards. And uh, I'm also directly involved trying to help farmers get accreditations like Global Gap and CESA Environmental, which also both um, credits a farmer for not removing natural corridors. So we, we definitely on in a, in a winning um, situation where farmers are not just removing 
uh, thinking before they, they do, and now also seeing the value through the research that, that Peter Tyler and, and the lab is doing. Yeah, I agree with Elche. Thanks, it's definitely Elche. becoming easier to uh, convince farmers and a lot of them uh, now after receiving information from us, uh, they are happy to leave a lot of uh, natural vegetation. But also since there is a lot of land use change, uh, if farmers are removing gum, I have had instances where farmers now by themselves say, okay, we're going to set this portion aside. Uh, and let it go back to bush because there's no point it's um, to uh, cultivate it with max or avos and we don't need more gum so um, yeah in a lot of instances farmers are happy to let certain portions go back to bush okay thank you um i've got another couple of questions which are touching on a different slightly different ecosystem service i suppose um, still interested in pest control, but from Hanani and um, Evelina, um, asking about bats um, having a significant role in controlling malaria mosquito populations in South Africa. Um, and if so, do you think that installing bat boxes can increase the provision of this ecosystem service? Um, Evelina is asking about dengue fe fever in Argentina, so along the same lines. So I'll start and then let Sina and Valerie. Um, I'm not aware of any particular studies in Southern Africa on mosquitoes. I might be wrong. I, I know there is quite a lot of growing evidence for especially small species of bats that can feed on large numbers of mosquitoes. So um, maybe one of my colleagues can add more detail to that. I don't, I don't know much more than you, Peter. I mean, I know there were studies in in the US on, um, I think, was it US or, yeah, on malaria um, control from, yeah, many years ago. Um, but yeah, I don't know anything about um, South African malaria control, nothing that is proven, or, but it makes sense. I think that Rachel might be able to comment just um, in, in an area of interest, really. Um, Rachel, would you like to comment on it? Well, I know um, we were certainly looking into it um, for, for Malawi, and there has been kind of growing evidence. I know there was some work done, um, I think, in the late 70s, early 80s in South Africa on the, the border between uh, Mozambique and South Africa. There was big bat houses built, but it's kind of anecdotal evidence. There's not actually any evidence. And as Peter had, had alluded to with, with their research, the, the difficulty is you can only tell the presence or absence um, in the droppings. So it's very difficult to actually get, you know, viability if, if the bats are having an, an actual knock-on effect um, for, for sort of something like, like malaria. Um, but I know that there has been different studies. I know they believe that bats were kind of caused the, the eradication of malaria in Texas as well, but as far as I know, that's again, just anecdotal and not um, in rigorous uh, research that's been done. Okay, great, thanks, Rachel. No um, does anybody else from Peter's team want to talk about that at all, mention anything about that? I think we're covered on that. So um, the next question was just from Debbie. Can I just ask Debbie, did you manage to see that video that Peter mentioned? Um, did you miss it or have you got it? If you wouldn't mind putting up your hand and and um, and unmuting yourself. Oh, Debbie had put that on before you asked uh, Peter to show it, Helen. Sorry. Okay, no problem. Yep, that's fine. So um, moving on, um, Mary is asking: Are farmers doing any selective control targeting monkeys while putting up bat boxes to attract bats? Um, well, I, I can start uh, start with that. Um, farmers are definitely starting to put up uh, bat boxes and simultaneously, uh, I mean, they've always been doing monkey um, control using uh, either monkey guards that are patrolling uh, natural bush borders to chase monkeys out. They're putting up fences, but of course fences aren't always um, overly effective. So uh, the monkey control has been um, in place for a while and now they are starting to put up bad boxes as well. 
and yeah we'll see how that works out okay great um evelina also mentioned about um it, could it be useful to settle bat houses to control bugs in large agricultural um crops like soya yeah I was just going to say, um, I know that it's been done in um, monocultural situations like sugarcane very successfully. Uh, bad houses are highly successful on the coastal region of KwaZulu Natal in South Africa. Um, they've been very successful in, in attracting large colonies of Angolan free tailed bats and other species of bats. One thing I just want to really caution all farmers um, about putting bad houses in crop lands and orchards is that direct effect of pesticides. As I alluded to in several instances, we came across bat houses with dead bats in them or under them. So placed directly inside the orchard. So we tell farmers if they're going to place bat houses, place them some distance away from where the crops are being sprayed. So I think that again, the same principle, place them away from crop fields where, where dangerous um, pesticides will, are being sprayed and so forth. I mean, the pesticides, really suppress insects to an incredible degree in, 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 in certainly in the macadamia landscape. Okay, great. Yep, definitely helps. <laughs> um, helpful uh, uh, advice in terms of placement of the bat boxes. Um, Renelman um, has also uh, asked the question, how do bats, bats react in nature to stressful stimulus? Uh, for example, fear, fight, uh, do they just change the roost? Um, Sina, do you want to answer that? You've done all the bat house work. Do you want to try and answer? Do you want to answer that? I don't know. Is Sina there? Uh, unmute Sina. Can you unmute yourself? Do you want to say anything about uh, roosts and, and bat responses to roosts and stress? Um, I don't know if she's able to. I, um, I know they do sometimes abandon roosts when there's, there's, there's um, a, a stress or something like that. I know some of the roosts we were looking, we were using um, to actually get data out of. We had a very nice roost and it was being predated by owls. So the whole roost just relocated. So something like a predator that's discovered a bat roost would be enough to make a, to bats for bats to avoid that, they, they're very intelligent and they know when there's a, a threat such as a, you know, a, an owl or a, a predator. But at the same time, um, many of the calls we get are from owners of, of houses where, which bats have bats in the, in the attic and the roof. And they, they find it impossible to dissuade the bats from leaving their, their roost. So I guess it varies a lot, the bat re response to different roosts. And sometimes they only use roosts for particular reasons. Um, that Sina did monitor bat houses throughout the year in this landscape and got quite a high occupancy of, of bats, but they wouldn't always be in the same bat house at the same time. So I, I don't know, I can't answer more specifically than that. I think a lot of bats also, if they do uh, vacate a roost, they, because of a predator or short term threat, they usually come back. So that's why a lot of people also struggle to get them out of their houses if they, um, you know, some just put up lights in the attic just to chase them out and then the, when the bats are away, they turn them off and then the bats come back. But yeah, they usually have some escape uh, or alternative roosts which um, they go to when there's a threat and um, they return to their preferred roost when possible. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just to, yeah, I know fruit bats roosting in trees, the Wahlberg's epileted fruit bats are very easily frightened away when they, they get disturbed. Because we've also been trying to GPS track fruit bats in the same landscape. And, you know, once they get disturbed by the owner of the homestead where they are, it takes can be a long time before they actually come back. So we, we lost a few bats that way by coloring them at a, at a roost and then the, the, the maid was actually throwing rocks at the fruit bats because they were messing up the, the patio where 
yeah, owner lived. So unfortunately our whole roost left several months ago and they haven't come back. Very interesting, yeah. Um, one comment related, I suppose, in terms of predation, um, Kate has mentioned monkeys will kill bats if they can get them. It's not necessarily a question, but uh, obviously a comment from her. Um, actually, at this point, maybe I'd like to ask a, a quick question. I, it's a very, very broad question, and, and I have an idea of what the answer may be, but what makes a successful bat house? Sorry, Peter, you're on mute still. <laughs> I was going to say, um, it's like any house. There are three important things, location, location, and location. It's like buying a house. I think it's where you put the bat house. Um, we find some of the generic designs have been uh, really quite successful, but it does depend where you put them. And yeah, Sina, I don't know whether Sina's able to unmute now because she, she can answer really specifically because she tested three different designs um, um she's not coming on so basically what she found was uh, the temperature was key was really key so she had a bank of three bed houses up in a row and the one that was insulated in the middle had higher occupancy than the others um because it was and the temperatures from i buttons um data showed that temperatures were warmer so they definitely temperatures are key is really a key important more than anything else okay yes i i would have to say that from our experience um we've, we're also finding something similar um renorman also followed up on your um predation question and disturbance question um follow-up question are fruit bats generally more fearful than insectivores sure i think kate richardson could answer that really well kate <laughs> Are you there? Having had it so many in captivity? Yeah, Kate? I am here. Um, I would say that because if you live in a tree, you have to be just that slightly wilder than if you live in a safe roost like a cave or a house roof. So yes, they're a little bit more nervy. Um, but probably also they have alternative roosts to go to. Nearly always where fruit bats live, there's another roost down the road that they can go to if they have to. So it's easier just to move. Yeah, I would agree. Thank you, Kate. Thanks, Kate. Um, there's also another question from Alon um, from the Philippines. Uh, he's asking, is there an effort from the environment arm of the government to protect the bat populations in macadamia farms? And also a follow up on from that, is land conversion done by local farmers or is there a bigger entity owning the macadamia business perpetuating the conversion? Again, I think maybe Valerie can give more details on the commercial side of it. Um, and I also missed the first part of that question, oh, if there's any laws. Um, basically, farmers are not supposed to clear land. There's nothing specific for macadamia, although the macadamia industry is well financed and they have their own South African Macadamia Association um, that, that funds research and that fund, you know, Elsha mentioned things like the global gap. There are these accreditation schemes which um, incentivize farmers not to clear land. At the same time, it's against the law in, the, in our country without an environmental impact as assessment. So the Department of Environment expects that there should be compliance. And um, as Alsha would also be able to tell us, she's involved with some of this, these issues. Farmers get fined um, a lot of money if they are found guilty of clearing um, woodland and, and forest trees and so forth. So but much of the time this goes on under the radar. So, you know, you've got the government providing some sort of legislation and you also have an industry that, but of course the profit is the, is the main concern. So I think, I, I don't know, Elsh could probably answer better. There's a lot of good ecologists trying to um, encourage um, sustainable farming practices, but they, they can't control all the farmers and I'm certainly aware of some practices that are that are unfriendly clearing of land and so forth that goes on all the time and I can't say that they are actively prosecuted. No, um, the problem is also that there's no monitoring of these illegal 
uh, land clearing. So the only thing you can do if you see it, you can actually report it and then they will go and investigate, but they're not um, going out um, and uh, looking looking themselves at whether or not land clearing is happening anywhere. But it's, yeah, it's the farmers themselves. And I think a little bit of a gray area is often also old lands, uh, which used to be agricultural land, but um, has been gone, going back to bush. And now it's more or less uh, natural bush, but there's some ever or guava trees underneath. So it, it's technically uh, an agricultural land that has been um, re-naturalized and now they are clearing it. So it's not a clearing of a natural area uh, per se, but um, yeah, of course it is now used as a natural habitat. Okay, thank you, Valerie. Um, another question from Rachel here. Um, is there a push for organic farming? Um, potentially very hard unless surrounding farmers all do the same. Yeah, I think that's a bit of that same question about the global gap and so forth. But what I've seen is it's not sustainable. My colleague um, has you mentioned earlier, Chris Stain. As part of his PhD research, he refrained from actually spraying his fields and he, and he was using organic methods um, of control um, for his research. And, you know, he found it varied from year to year. You know, so when there was a bad stink bug season of one particular pest, his, he was swamped and, um, you know, he, he suffered a loss. And because farmers in the region and the areas around him, as you say, weren't practicing those same um, ecological methods. So he was planting, you know, crop trap, trap crops and he was plant, planting natural verges and so forth. But other farmers weren't doing that. And so when there was a bad outbreak, it, they, the, the, the think bugs moved across to his orchards and, you know, he, I don't think he could sustain it as a farmer. So I think everybody in the region has to um, work in an integrated way to agree um, not to, to spray. And it used to be that the areas higher up the mountains where it was colder did not need to spray as much because natural methods, there was more natural bush and possibly the temperatures were too cold. But with global warming, with climate change, we have seen those same areas, um, also the newer areas, so it takes longer for the pests to establish. Those areas where, where five, 10 years ago, did not have to spray and could do organic methods are now in an economic position where they, their damage is too high. So it's a really difficult question. I think it's just a question of minimizing the, the timing, as I say, using scouting methods to only spray when, when it's absolutely necessary. Minimize the spray. But it's possible, I don't think, to be completely organic. I don't know whether Elsha might have an idea about that. Elsha, would you like to comment on that? I'm not sure if she's still. No, she might not be. Yeah, Elsha, Elsha has left. Okay, no problem. Um, yeah, so that's a really good um, uh, uh, take home message, I suppose, that uh, it, it's a, an integrative approach that needs to be taken. Um, one question that I had, um, you mentioned about staff stoning bats. Um, is there a very big problem in the region of persecution of bats, whether it be direct um, uh, killing of bats or using pesticides or chemicals in general? Do you have any experience of that directly? Um, I think probably no more or no less than anywhere else. We have seen some cases, for example, or well, recently we had a very important cave colony that was lost because local religious uh, leaders started to use it for their church services. And the local community were actually horrified because it was one of their sacred sites. So, you know, in vendor, in the, 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 in the vendor customs, the area where we live in, communities often have, have taboos and sacred sites that protect some of these sites of natural forests, mountains, and caves. But we know that, you know, with westernization and, and young people not having the same, the same ethic, um, we have, we saw at least in one case, this really important roost. We're not sure if they were Rosetta's bats, but um, uh, we, we suspected it might've been a, a fruit bat cave, uh, Egyptian fruit bat colony. 
that one of my students, he, he, when he eventually got to visit it, he went with one of the guardians of the custodians of the sacred site. And they were horrified that there was evidence of fires and, and litter and uh, they realized that it had been vandalized. So also among the commercial farming communities, often the, the families, the, the, the farmers themselves have a, a natural fear of bats and, in their roof and so forth. But I don't know if it's more than anywhere else in South Africa or Africa. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I suppose that just to open the floor a little bit longer, if anybody else would like to ask any questions. Um, does anybody else have any more questions? It looks like questions are finished. Um, where I have a quick question, Helen. Um, yeah, carry on. <laughs> I have a question related to the Bats of Southern and Central Africa, which is the second edition. We are very excited to be coming out. And Peter Taylor is one of the authors, um, and Ara Monagem, who's on here. And I was just wondering if there's an update on when the book's coming out, because we're all desperately waiting to buy one. <laughs> 20, 20, 25th of September. <laughs> That's the, the print date. It was delayed by a month because of the COVID. So oh, exciting. This Great. University Press, 25th of September. Thanks, thanks for allowing that um, advertise. Ad yeah. Great. So what we'll do, everybody, is we'll also we'll put that um, through social media as well, just to give you all a reminder. But yeah, and get those orders in quick. We were told um, by a speaker who was on um, Ara Monagem's talk that actually you can pre-order them um, in the UK, so presumably in Europe and maybe in, in the US. So if you're able to do so, then you can, you can do that already. Okay, great. I'm also looking forward to it coming out. So yes, I will also be putting in my order. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so um, I think that comes to the end of question time. We've got a lot of thank yous and great talk, really good talk, questions. Thank you for the awesome talk. Lots of uh, lots of good um, comments back for you, Peter and team. Um, so I'll thank pass you so to much. Rachel. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, well, thank you um, very much to Peter and Valerie and Sina for this fantastic work. And uh, we look forward to hearing more about your research going forward. And just to, to thank everybody for, for attending today. And as I mentioned, we're really excited to be carrying on these webinars next year. So please do let us know if you have any ideas um, for either speakers or topics again. I think ecosystem services are really important um, topic at the moment and certainly in terms of you know negative perceptions of bats and um, being even you know made worse by by kind of COVID so if um, you know we might try and actually get some more ecosystem services talks um, going as well so thank you very much Peter and team from the University of Bender and thanks Helen for doing the questions. Thanks Rachel, thanks Helen, thanks everybody.